Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Acronix with Kent Orthner, who's going to talk today about embedded FPGA acceleration. So Kent, we've heard a lot more about embedded FPGAs these days, particularly in terms of high-performance computing, where they're starting to uh, gain some traction, which they didn't have in the past. What's changing? What are some of the problems that you're seeing? Well, thank you very much for the introduction, Ed. Let me start that off by drawing the typical FPGA acceleration system. Right? So you have your CPU device that has a CPU cluster. Typically there's more than one nowadays. You can get a pretty significant number. So we've got a couple of CPUs. We've got an on-chip interconnect, which provides a CPU with access to a DDR controller, which in turn is connected to some physical DDR devices. So that's your main very, very simple compute system. When talking to an FPGA-based accelerator, most systems today use PCI Express. So I'm going to draw a PCI Express IP core here, and it would be connected to this main interconnect that allows the rest of the system to communicate. This would typically be connected to the FPGA-based accelerator via a PCI Express core here, that provides communications between the two. On most high-performance compute systems, the FPGA would also have its own DDR controller and its own dedicated DDR memory. So here's the basic system in the basic setup. The issues that people see today with this kind of acceleration involve the fact that the FPGA is logically far away via this thin and high latency PCI Express. It's almost like You've got your CPU cluster here on Earth, and you've got your accelerator on the moon, and you can send a fair amount of data back and forth, but it takes a long time to get there. And latency is the big issue when you start getting into acceleration, right? That's one of the really top issues that people have to worry about. Absolutely. If you look at typical applications, latency defines what can be accelerated, because you can only accelerate an algorithm that is meaty enough and big enough that it dominates over the communication latency. If you look at a latency for a system like this, if you were to find yourself a low latency PCI Express core on the FPGA, it'll advertise that you can get a round trip latency here of on the order of one microsecond. If you take a Linux implementation to actually measure it as seen by the software doing a read, you're looking more on the order of 15 microseconds. I'm gonna mark that over here so we see 15 microseconds for the Linux operating system but the PCI Express core advertises around one. There's discrete FPGAs, there's embedded FPGAs. What's the difference in terms of how one does on this problem versus another? With an embedded FPGA, you can see significant improvements in the key metrics. So I'm gonna write out a couple of the improvements that I'm gonna show you today. So if we look at how we can improve latency, this is the big one. And I'm going to show you how for a real high-performance compute application, we can give you a 100,000x improvement in latency. For three throughput, which is another important metric, we can easily get to a 25x improvement. We can improve power. We can improve, we can also improve the area consumed by the FPGA. Power we get to about a 2x improvement area, I'll show you that we get up to a 4x improvement. We can do all of this by taking the FPGA and bringing it onto the same die as the CPU clusters. There are three elements that you have to deal with in, in any design, one of which is power, the second one is performance, which is what you're addressing here, the third one is area. What happens in area? Sure. Well, let's begin by looking at this traditional FPGA system. Some of the area is taken up just by your protocol cores. You've got DDR, you've got PCI Express. Modern FPGAs typically harden part of this, but there's a portion of the soft FPGA that is still used to handle the transactions and do something with it. You then have a section of the FPGA that's used just for communications overhead and scheduling. So I'm just going to call that communications. That would manage things like PCI Express data is arriving and it has to be stored in the local DDR memory before it can be used. Finally, you have some portion of the FPGA that's actually being used for executing the algorithm. In FPGA acceleration platforms, 
the communication and IP protocol overhead can be half the entire device. So you've lost half of the FPGA area before you've even started accelerating anything. So what happens with an embedded FPGA? How does that change the picture? Sure. With an embedded FPGA, what we're doing is taking this core FPGA fabric that has lookup tables, registers, uh, memory arrays, DSP blocks, and we're actually moving it onto the same die as the compute. So we end up with an FPGA core right here. Now first off, I'm drawing this FPGA core to be the same size as the algorithm block because all of this here can disappear. So this here is just translated literally from your existing and traditional FPGA. So right away, we've lost half the area. We then lose power because we no longer need to drive the PCI Express interface. We can lose the external DDR because this FPGA block can access the main compute subsystem's DDR memory. We can also lose all of the communications overhead here and the time it takes. So when you move something onto the same chip, you typically drop the latency because you're on the same chip. You don't have to send data as far. What happens here? Uh, absolutely. You'll find that latency is where you get the biggest improvement when you embed the FPGA inside the rest of the SOC or the compute cluster. We talked previously about the latency for simple transactions are on the order of one microsecond at the PCI Express boundary or at the order of 15 microseconds as seen by the software. When you look at an actual algorithm that's being implemented here, what you'll typically see is the CPU needs to set up some data. So it writes to the DDR core, its local DDR core, to set up the data array that the accelerator needs to work with. It will then send a message to its internal DMA engine, which is responsible for taking this block of memory that is now existing in the DDR memory and transferring it over the PCI Express link to the FPGA's DDR interface. So you're moving this big block of data across. You then need to send a second message from the CPU to the FPGA acceleration algorithm block telling it to get to work. It then needs to read in all of this data, process it, and write it back out again when it's complete. It then tells the CPU, either via an interrupt-like mechanism, a message over PCI Express, or the CPU simply pulls it, and then the CPU will have its DMA controller transfer all of this data, the results, back to its local memory where it can work on it. What we find with a real algorithm is that that can take on the order of 25 milliseconds for that entire thing to complete. So what does this mean for a real application? Well, if you look at a real application that's going to be executed on a CPU, it's going to take some amount of time. There is one I was looking at recently that can be divided into two parts, and just in this particular case, the second part was 86%, and that's the part that we focused on accelerating. So what we wanted to do was bring this down to a smaller period of time, and then this here, that was the 14% of the algorithm, we're just going to leave that alone for now. What we found that with this 25 millisecond limitation, if we simply took the algorithm, threw it across to the FPGA and said go without thinking much about it, we actually had less performance with this FPGA acceleration than what we started with. We were able to batch the transactions together so that instead of sending across the data for a single run of the algorithm and then collecting the results, we sent over thousands and then we told the FPGA to get to work. We found that once we sent on the order of 250,000 sets of data and then told the FPGA to get going, it was able to see a you know, pretty reasonable improvement. We were able to get a 2.5x improvement over the original runtime on the CPU. That means that this 86% of the runtime was reduced significantly. This ended up being only 10% of the original, but we still had this 14% overhead. So we were able to reduce the overall execution time by about 2.5x using a traditional FPGA with all of this latency. And this is sort of comparable to how far you've drawn this on the whiteboard, right? I mean, it just takes longer to go that distance. Absolutely. And across this tiny, thin little line, versus the really wide and fast interfaces that you can have here between your interconnect. So let's map out what that would look like. If I take this same picture here and look at it with an embedded FPGA, let me switch colors, the CPU would again begin by writing the data to be operated on to the DDR. 
we don't need to transfer it to the moon. Instead, the CPU can immediately tell the FPGA accelerator to get to work. It can read the data directly from this DDR memory. There's no need to transfer it all the way over here, read it in, and write it back and transfer it back. When it's done, it simply informs the CPU, and the CPU is able to get to work immediately on whatever the next follow-up action is. When you do this in the embedded space, how much faster is that than doing it with a discrete chip? Excellent question. So we were talking about 25 milliseconds overall previously, and a lot of that was just shuffling data back and forth. A lot of that was doing double the necessary reads and writes to different DDR memories. With this, we're looking at on the order of 100 to 150 clock cycles to do writes to DDR, and about the same to do reads. Messaging back and forth between the CPU and the accelerator via an on-chip interconnect, that takes on the order of tens of clock cycles. So I would say overall we can accomplish all of this in about two and a half microseconds total. Now that's because we're transferring, we're still transferring a significant amount of data. So we're still going back and forth to the DDR memory a fair bit, which we're now at on the order of 10,000x better. We still have an order of magnitude left. You know, one of the other metrics that comes in here is uh, bitstream loading. How does that affect this? Or the time it takes to load the bitstream for an embedded FPGA is significantly faster than for a traditional FPGA. The reason being that this interface here can be low latency and for bitstream loading, high throughput interface that doesn't have the same constraints as an FPGA bitstream configuration interface that uses physical pins. Typically here you have a serial interface to an EEPROM or you have maybe an 8-bit wide processor interface. Here you can have something like a 128-bit wide AXI interface. So what we found is that this provides roughly a 16x performance improvement over a physical interface here that's 8-bit wide running at 100, interface, at 100 megahertz. And we see on the order of 128x improvement if this is just a serial interface instead of being 8-bits wide. So overall, we can configure an embedded FPGA that has 100,000 lookup tables in under 2 milliseconds. And the software that goes with this is typically easier to program than you would get out of an ASIC or an ASSP, right? Considerably. So the big difference here is, again, back to all of this PCI Express work. In order to configure this FPGA and have it get to work, you're writing to memory, you're talking to a DMA engine, you're sending stuff over a PCI Express core, et cetera, et cetera. If you look at the embedded FPGA solution, you're just setting up your data, you're giving the accelerator the pointer to the data, you're waiting for the results, and you're done. Okay, last piece out of PPA is the power. What happens on, on an embedded FPGA with power? So, this will probably be pretty obvious to most of your readers, but the power is going to go significantly down, largely because you're no longer going to be driving these long copper traces out on the PCB. Right? These are typically high-speed traces. You've got this 30s that's driving them up and down as fast as it can. On the order of 16 gigahertz for a typical PCI Express link, you've got eight of them, 16 of them, what have you. All of that goes away. The second DDR interface goes away, so you're no longer driving this at 1.6 gig in parallel. The FPGA itself just becomes much smaller and much less power intensive. So you've got uh, improvements both in terms of lower capacitance, lower uh, resistance on the wires, you've got uh, shorter distances, and you've got a wider pipe, right? That's correct. Now, speaking of a wider pipe, what I drew here was this 128-bit AXI interface. You can run this on the order of a gigahertz if you're inside a modern SOC. Really fast ones run on the order of two and a half, three gigahertz. The FPGA, of course, doesn't run that fast but you can run the interface into the FPGA that fast and then you widen it internally so that you can handle the throughput. With an embedded FPGA solution, you're not pin limited. It's not like you're trying to cram the entire interface into the minimum number of pins here. We have incredible richness of pins. So it's really easy to take multiple logical accelerators and give them all independent AXI interfaces. So instead of looking at 128 gigabit per second, now we're looking at 256. There's really no limit to the number of interfaces we can have here, given that your on-chip interconnects can support it. 
So if you consider a big embedded FPGA that has eight parallel AXI interfaces, all running at a gigahertz, all 128 bits wide, we've now given you a solution that supports one terabit per second data transfer to and from your accelerators. And you have much more granularity with this kind of approach than you would, say, with uh, programming it into hardware, and it's also faster than it would be if you were doing it all in software too, right? Oh, well, absolutely. So being faster than software is because you're taking the algorithm and you're accelerating it here by basically giving it dedicated hardware that implements exactly what that algorithm needs. You're not selecting from a set of two or three hundred primitive extensions that the CPU can run. You're dedicating hardware that can run it all in parallel. As far as the fine-grained hardware is concerned, not only can you have fine-grained programmable hardware in the embedded FPGA, but with a blended ASIC FPGA solution, you can go even further. So let me give you an example. Consider a high-performance compute algorithm that's doing some sort of object recognition from a video stream. It's looking for faces or it's looking for hubcaps in an assembly line or something like that. The way the algorithms work is they consider all of these small rectangles within the image that are a constant size, say 20 pixels square. Then it's doing an arithmetic, typically relatively simple arithmetic operations, on all of these different bits. Because the image that it works with, the, the rectangle within the image, is 20 bits wide, it's selecting from 400 potential pixels, 20 by 20. Typical implementations of this algorithm in an FPGA are dominated by 400 to 1 muxes that are as wide as the pixel is, because you're always choosing which pixels you're looking at for these algorithms. If you were to take a speed core embedded FPGA and decide to put the multiplexers in the ASIC portion of the design. You know you're doing object recognition. You want the reprogrammability because you don't know what objects you're going to need to recognize when this goes out in the field, but you know you're doing object recognition, so you need these 400 to 1 muxes. Instead of implementing them inside the FPGA, where they're on the order of 2,000 lookup tables each, you can tease them out into the ASIC, control them with the FPGA, and get a huge area reduction. For the object recognition algorithm that we were working on, the 400 to 1 multiplexers took on the order of 60% of the FPGA logic inside the accelerator. So by doing this, we've reduced the area to be consumed by the FPGA by 60%. And we've done that because with an embedded FPGA, you, the designer, can control what goes in programmable logic and what goes in ASIC logic. And the key to this, again, is you're not talking to your device that's far, far away. You're talking to it that's right here in your chip, and you have really good control over what's going on. Ken Orthner, thanks for a great explanation. Okay, thank you for your time, and thanks for listening, everyone.